The technique of administering spinal anesthesia can be described as the four P's. Preparation, position, projection, and puncture. As part of the preparation, discuss with the patient options for anesthesia, explain the risk and benefits of each procedure, choose an appropriate local anesthetic, choose the appropriate spinal needle, if a prepackaged spinal kit is not available, assemble the flowing equipment such as sterile towels, sterile gloves, sterile spinal needle, and introducer needle. If using a small gauge needle, this can be a sterile 19 gauge disposable needle, sterile filter needle to draw up medications, sterile 5 ml syringe for the spinal solution. Sterile 2 ml syringe with a small gauge needle to localize the skin prior initiation of the spinal anesthetic. Antiseptics for the skin such as betadine, chlorhexidine or methyl alcohol. Sterile gauge for skin cleansing and to wipe off excess antiseptic at needle puncture site. Single use preservative free local anesthetic ampoule. Prior to initiating a spinal block carefully wash your hands the patient should be attached to standard monitors including ECG blood pressure and pulse oximeter record an initial set of vital signs establish IV access with a large bore IV cannula and attach to a crystalloid solution at any point during the administration of spinal anesthesia, if sterility is questioned or contamination of equipment occurs, stop and start over with sterile equipment. Now coming to positioning, proper positioning is essential for a successful block. Proper positioning can be difficult for several reasons. First, your assistant may not understand how the patient should be positioned or the rationale behind positioning. Second, the patient may not understand your instructions. Third, sedation may make the patient unable to cooperate or follow directions. There are three positions used for the administration of spinal anesthesia, namely lateral decubitus, sitting, and prone. Lateral decubitus allows the anesthesia provider to administer more sedation, meaning less dependence on an assistant for positioning. The patient is positioned with their back parallel with the side of the OR table. Thighs are flexed up and neck is flexed forward. Call fetal position. Patient should be positioned to take advantage of the baricity of the spinal local anesthetic. Sitting position is used for anesthesia of the lumbar and sacral levels, whether urological or perineal surgeries. Higher levels of anesthesia can be obtained if an appropriate dose of local anesthetic is administered and the patient is quickly positioned to maximize the spread of local anesthetic. Identify anatomical landmarks. This may be a challenge in the obese or those with abnormal anatomical curvatures of the spine. Place the patient's feet on a stool, have the patient sit up straight, head flexed, arms hugging a pillow or on a table in front of them. Make sure the patient does not simply lean forward. A number of descriptions may help the patient understand how they should position themselves, for example, Please arch your back to resemble the letter C or arch your back like a mad cat. This will maximize the opening of vertebral interspaces. For a lower or sacral block, such as in sacral block, leave the patient sitting for 5 minutes before assuming a supine position. Lastly, the prone positioning is used when the patient will be in this position for the surgical procedure, for example in rectal, perineal or lumbar procedures. Here hypobaric local anesthetics are administered. Patient positions self 
lumbar lordosis should be minimized, a paramedian approach is often used. Now coming to the projection and puncture, the last two P's, there are two approaches to accessing the subarachnoid space, the paramedian and midline approaches. The midline approach affords the practitioner two advantages. Anatomic projection is only in two planes, making visualization of the intended trajectory and anatomical structures more apparent. The midline approach provides a relatively avascular plane. It is important to have the patient sitting up straight, not slumping to the side, to minimize lumbar lordosis and maximize the space between the spinous processes. By proper positioning, you should have access to L2, L3, L3, L4, L4, L5, and L5, S1. Identify the top of the ideal crest. The first line generally corresponds with the fourth lumbar vertebra. The first line is a line drawn across the ilia crest that crosses the body of L4 or L4 L5 interspace. This is a helpful landmark for the placement of spinal or epidural anesthetics. Palpation in the midline should help to identify the interspinous ligament. The extent of the space is noted by palpating the cephalot and caudal spine. The midline is noted by moving your fingers from medial to lateral. Now, wash your hands, put on sterile gloves, use sterile technique, prepare the tray in a sterile fashion. An assistant may help with opening in sterile fashion specific items. Prepare the bag with an antiseptic, start at the area of intended injection and move out. This is done three times. Place a skin wheel of local anesthetic at the intended spinous interspace. Smaller gauge needles will require an introducer to stabilize the needle. Place the introducer firmly into the interspinous ligament. Now, anatomical structures that will be transversed include skin, subcutaneous fat, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligamentum flavum, epidural space, and dura mater. Grasp the introducer with one hand and hold the spinal needle like a dart or a pencil. Cutting needle should be inserted with the bevel parallel to the longitudinal fibers of the dura. This helps reduce cutting fibers and enhance tactile sensation as anatomical structures are crossed. Control the needle carefully. Be prepared for unanticipated movement of the patient. As the ligamentum flavum and dura are transversed, a change in resistance is noted. Some will describe this as a pop, however, it may be a decrease in pressure or a loss of resistance. Once in the subarachnoid space, remove the stylet and CSF should appear. If CSF does not appear, rotate the needle 90 degrees until it appears. If no CSF appears, then the stylet should be replaced. With smaller gauge needles, it may take 20 to 30 seconds for CSF to appear. Assess the needle position. Is it an appropriate depth? Is it midline or is it or is its trajectory off the midline? Being off the midline is one of the most common reasons that CSF does not come back. If off the midline, remove the needle and start over. If blood returns from the needle, wait to see if it clears. If it does not clear, reassess needle position. If the needle is midline, not lateral, it may be an epidural vein. Advance the needle slightly further to transverse the dura. If the needle is not midline, remove it and start over. If the patient complains of a sharp pain in the hips or legs while inserting the needle, immediately remove the needle and reassess the approach. When the needle is not midline, it is not uncommon to encounter a nerve root. Before starting again, make sure that the pain has stopped. If bone is encountered, 
reassess the patient's position and show the needle is midline. If bone is contacted early, the needle may be contacting the spinous process. Move the needle slightly coded. If bone is contacted late, the needle may be contacting the lamina of the vertebra. Move the needle slightly cephalot. Moving down an interspace may increase the chance of success since the intervertebral space will be larger. After unsuccessful attempts, consider converting to a general anesthetic. The more attempts, the more trauma, increasing the risk of a spinal or epidural hematoma. When CSF returns, steady the needle with the dorsum of a non-dominant hand against the patient's back, attach the syringe with the intended spinal anesthetic, gently aspirate some CSF into the syringe. If a hyperbaric technique is being used, a swirling in the solution will be noted due to the dextrose content. Aspiration with an isobaric technique will yield additional CSF fluid into the syringe. The cerebral spinal fluid should be clear. If blood is returned with aspiration, replace the stylet and start over. Inject the local anesthetic at a rate of 0.2 ml per second. After injection, aspirate 0.2 ml of CSF to confirm that the needle remains in the subparagonate space. If the patient complains of pain during injection, stop immediately, redirect the needle away from the side of pain and into the midline. Place the patient in the appropriate position for the procedure and baricity of the spinal anesthetic solution. The advantage of the paramedian approach is a larger target. By placing the needle laterally, the anatomical limitation of the spinous process is avoided. The most common error when attempting this technique is being too far from the midline, which makes encountering the vertebral lamina more likely. For a paramedian approach, palpate the vertebral process and identify the caudal tip. Move one centimeter down and one centimeter laterally. Prepare the back with an antiseptic solution. Place a skin wheel of local anesthetic at the identified area of needle insertion. A longer needle is often required to infiltrate the tissue. Insert the introducer or spinal needle 10 to 15 degrees off the sagittal plane. At this point, the most common error is inserting the needle too far, cephalot, which results in encountering the lamina of the vertebral body. If bone is contacted, redirect the needle a little further caudate. It may be possible to feel the characteristic change in resistance or loss of resistance. With a lateral approach, the needle is inserted further than with the midline approach. Once CSF is obtained, continue in the same manner as the midline approach. After successful placement, the patient should be monitored continuously for block progression and complications. The patient's blood pressure should be taken every 3 minutes initially. More frequently if needed, the patient should be monitored for the following. Number 1. Block progression. Ensure that the block is adequate for the surgical procedure and it does not progress too high. Number 2. Hypotension. Do it aggressively if blood pressure decreases by 20% or more from baseline. Number 3. Bradycardia. Do it aggressively. It may progress to cardiac arrest. Number 4. Numbness of the arms and hands may indicate that the block is too high. Number 5. Problems with breathing may indicate that the block is too high. Number 6. Change in level of consciousness. Now, coming to post-operative care, patients recovering from a spinal anesthetic should receive the same vigilant monitoring as the patient recovering from a general anesthetic. In addition, the patient should be assessed for block regression. The patient with a spinal is more likely to experience hypotension in the post-operative period. Treatment includes a trendelin bar position, additional IV fluids, oxygen, and vasopressors as needed. Urinary retention should be assessed with patients that do not have a urinary catheter. 
The patient should not be discharged from the recovery area until vital signs are stable and the spinal block is regressing. The patient should remain in bed until full sensory and motor function has returned. The first time a patient is ambulated, a nurse should assist the patient to ensure full function has returned.